Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tal Arbel. I'm a professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at McGill University. And I'm a uh, MILA Canadian CIFAR AI chair. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some work that's being conducted in my research team, um, in my research group called Machine Learning for Medical Image Analysis. And I'll tell you a bit about some of the research that we've done over time. Uh, and some of the students who uh, led this research can be found at the bottom of the screen. Um, so uh, I think everything that I'm going to be talking about today is very much in line with the rest of the talks that were presented earlier. So again, this is, uh, research, this is my research team, past and present. I just want to acknowledge the a subset of my collaborators, which are direct, directly related to this research, Dr. Arnold, who will speak shortly, uh, Doina Prekup from McGill, Mila, and DeepMind, Tal Hasner um, from Facebook AI, and Yaren Gal, who works on uncertainty with us from Oxford. So as we know, um, Machine learning and medical imaging has the potential to make huge advances in medicine and in healthcare, assisting in things like patient diagnosis. So here's an example of uh, diagnosing breast cancer, understanding disease development. So for example, here's an image of a normal brain and one uh, with Alzheimer's disease. Predicting patient outcome from images. So for example, here's an image of patient, of, um, uh, patients with specific cancers, and the, the prediction are things like survival time. Um, speeding up and making accurate clinical trials for new treatments, so that's something that we're going to specifically be speaking about today. On the right, you can see a brain tumor um, of a patient, both the T1 contrast MRI and the diffusion-weighted imaging, and you can see that with treatment, the brain tumor is shrinking and the patient is responding to treatment and permitting advances in personalized medicine, one of the themes of today. So this is things like supposing the computer will predict that um, this person's uh, it, brain will not change over time. This could be conveyed to a clinician. The clinician can then note and say, okay, the computer thinks this patient will be stable for the next year and then make a personalized medical decision. So as we know, there's been a huge amount of work uh, and successful work in adapting and, and developing machine learning frameworks for a variety of uh, problems in medical imaging from segmentation to prediction and classification. Um, however, the resulting approaches have not yet been widely integrated into clinical practice, as we have discussed uh, today at great length. So why is that? So there were a lot of... Um, uh, ideas presented earlier, a lot of it in line with what I'm about to say. Um, so there are many reasons why not. Uh, one reason is that medical imaging uh, borrows a lot of uh, or adapts a lot of the theory from the field of computer vision. Um, and medical imaging has very unique challenges. Uh, data are particularly uncertain um, and the problems are specifically quite hard. And a lot of the techniques that are developed uh, for computer vision are not um, applicable for the kind of medical imaging problems that we have. Errors uh, can be have huge consequences if integrated into the clinic and uh, generally if presented to the clinician will lead to mistrust uh, by clinicians and hesitation in adoption of the methods into the clinic. Also, we know that machine learning algorithms are often developed in computer science or electrical engineering labs, where uh, there's often little access to large scale annotated data needed for training. And also there's often a disconnect and, and little access to the clinician and the real clinical needs, um, which should be made accessible uh, as the methods are being developed. So as a result, many of the techniques in, in the field are based on um, the availability of smaller proprietary or benchmarking data sets, what we call challenges. Um, as a result, they may not be robust to patient or data variability across different centers and scanners. And a lot of uh, the machine learning um, medical imaging community are optimizing their methods to win the challenges. So they are basing it on the established metrics of success. And oftentimes those metrics of success may not be important for the specific clinical task of interest. 
So one example, um, which I think is important, uh, is, is, for example, uh, segmentation in medical imaging. So automatic segmentation is, is an area of research in medical imaging analysis that's very, very important for a lot of clinical domains. And, um, and you can see on the right uh, some traditional computer vision uh, benchmarking data sets for segmentation. Uh, on which people are developing methods. So you can see here, for example, there's um, uh, the, the techniques have to segment an object. It's well-defined, uh, different from its background. You can use shape and prior information and uh, in your models. And so these techniques that are popular in computer vision um, may be uh, applicable to things like healthy structure segmentation in, in, in medical imaging. For example, here you can see segmentation of the ventricles in the brain, which might be important, uh, or, or the hippocampus and so on. This might be um, it, it, you know, doable. We have a specific region of interest that we're looking at, and then we basically um, can use things like shape and other priors to help us. It might also be applicable for segmenting big, uh, large pathological structures uh, in, in images. But there's a large number of contexts where patients have multiple unknown number of focal pathologies or lesions. Some examples on the right include um, le these GAD lesions, which I'll, we'll talk about shortly, and multiple sclerosis, white matter hyperintensities, brain tumors, and so on. And here, the clinical objective is, is to find them all to be able to diagnose and stage the disease. So really, first, we want to detect them, and then we want to delineate the boundaries. And these present challenges to traditional machine learning methods for in computer vision. Here you can see an example with breast cancer, and you can see some of the challenges. Uh, we often, we'd like to find, if there are any um, indications of breast cancer, we'd like to detect breast cancer um, structures. And you can see they often look like other uh, structures that light up in the image. They're hard to find, they can be small, it's hard to leverage prior information. Um, and we don't know if there are any in this image uh, or how many there might be. And so um, you can see the challenges that we have, and we're gonna to talk today about two specific contexts, one in the context of, of multiple sclerosis, and the second one in the context of segmenting um, structures within brain tumors. So the way in which the talk will, will go today is first, um, we have a sh short presentation by Dr. Arnold, who is a neurologist, and he'll talk a little bit about multiple sclerosis and clinical trial analysis and the need for precision medicine. Then I'll talk a little bit about some work in my group on detecting and segmenting lesions um, and focal pathologies from patient medical images and predicting future disease evolution, which is what we're working on now. And then a PhD student in my group, Raghav Mehta, will talk a little bit about modeling and conveying uncertainties in deep learning models and how to propagate uncertainties across a sequencer of cascaded medical imaging tasks in order to improve the deep learning inference. And he'll talk specifically about the context of brain tumor segmentation and synthesis of missing MRI sequences. And hopefully I'll, I'll have a few minutes to talk about some current work in the lab and some open challenges. So without further ado. Uh, very good. Okay, so uh, my name is Douglas Arnold. I'm a neurologist um, at the Montreal Neurological Institute and uh, of McGill uh, with uh, special expertise in MRI, particularly as, uh, uh, as employed to investigate uh, multiple sclerosis or MS. I also had an imaging CRO that provides MRI services to pharma for drug development. Um, and a international collaboration to federate a large uh, MRI and clinical database to facilitate uh, AI methods uh, aimed to increase efficiency of early, st uh, early stage clinical trials in MS, hence my, uh, my involvement in this, in this talk. So for those of you who may not be uh, familiar, multiple sclerosis is um, uh, a, uh, uh, the most common uh, disease, a neurologic disease that affects young people. It's an inflammatory demyelinating disease. It's also associated with neurodegeneration. And the pathogenesis is shown in the panel on the right. The inflammatory cells, which are in red, attack myelin, which is the insulation or the sheath around myelin, uh, and damage the myelin and, and potentially also the nerve fiber, the axon that goes, uh, that goes uh, uh, travels within that myelin. If that fiber is sufficiently damaged to be effectively cut 
um, the distal portion uh, past the cut will degenerate because it's disconnected from the cell body. Um, and hence, the, there is a degenerative component associated with, um, with this inflammatory attack on the myelin. Uh, it may be that the, the axon survives the acute demyelination and, and even remyelinates. Uh, but um, in, in many cases, uh, the axon does not properly remyelinate and the, 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 the naked axon, uh, devoid of myelin, has a limited lifespan and will subsequently uh, undergo premature uh, degeneration, resulting in, uh, in additional uh, degenerative component uh, of the disease. There are basically two forms of MS, a relapsing uh, MS in which patients have intermittent attacks of neurologic uh, impairment, followed by variable recovery, which may be full or not. Um, about 10% of patients have prog a progressive form of MS in which the relapses uh, do not appear, but they have a progressive uh, uh, accumulation of, uh, of disability. There's no cure for this disease, but there are uh, uh, treatments, uh, and these can be very effective for uh, uh, suppressing the focal inflammatory uh, component of the disease that I've just described to you. They're much less effective at preventing the degenerative component of the disease, um, hence, there is a major effort uh, uh, being undertaken to try and develop uh, better drugs for the, the, the progressive component of MS. The hallmark of MS is a uh, multifocal uh, MR, uh, lesions on MRI, which you can see in the panel on the right uh, in grayscale in the left image and uh, with the lesions highlighted in red uh, on the, in the right-hand panel. Um, acutely inflamed lesions that are less than about a month old are gadolinium enhancing and associated with new T2 lesion formation. Uh, they, gad they, they enhance with GAD because the inflammation increases the permeability of the blood-brain barrier and the contrast can get into these lesions. Uh, after about a month, the acute inflammation will resolve uh, and the GAD enhancement resolves. Uh, but a, a, a T2 lesion or a new T2 lesion is left behind as a marker of the, uh, of the tissue injury. Thus, the total T2 lesion volume is a marker of the burden of disease related to lesions. Uh, the normal appearing tissue is, uh, in fact, not uh, completely normal. It's also affected by the disease. It has a component of degeneration associated with it and some inflammation, which is uh, of a different sort that you don't see with gadolinium. Uh, but the normal appearing brain tissue involvement is also important for, uh, for a disease progression, and so we can't ignore it. Um, this talk is concerned with drug development and uh, assessment of drug efficacy, and this is usually done uh, in, in what are called clinical trials. Uh, clinical trials um, uh, for MS at, at the end of their stage and then need to have clinical outcomes to assess their efficacy, primarily relapses. But this outcome is rather inefficient. Uh, it's noisy and uh, does not occur at very high uh, frequency. Uh, and so there is a, uh, a heavy reliance on MRI biomarkers of inflammatory activity. Uh, in earlier stages of MS uh, drug development to allow for much shorter and smaller trials. And in, in, in these trials, uh, the, the markers that we use or the outcome measures that we use are uh, usually some measure of new T2 lesion formation and some measure of gadolinium enhancing uh, lesion formation. Um, in the past, the somewhat remote past now, these lesions were uh, identified and segmented manually or with some uh, uh, you know, semi-audited uh, computer help. This was a slow uh, process that was uh, expensive and uh, uh, more importantly, inconsistent, uh, i.e. Uh, resulting in variable data that increased uh, the, the sample sizes required to show uh, drug effect. Um, and so there was a need for automated methods for both detection and segmentation of lesions. And as Tal alluded to in her introduction, uh, the, um, the, the key to this is not necessarily the same as, uh, as um, many, uh, many other uh, computer vision tasks and, uh, and methods for assessing them are concerned. We're interested in detection primarily uh, so that we, uh, we don't miss uh, new activity on the scans. And this, uh, this detection needs to be consistent uh, over time. It needs to be robust across uh, multiple scanners because there are many scanners involved in clinical trials. 
it needs to be robust to the different stages uh, of the disease. Um, so to assess MS activity, we want to detect all the lesions, even the small ones, which are uh, substantially more challenging than, than the large ones. You can see here um, the, uh, uh, the um, number of lesions and the number of small spots that you're trying to detect in the field of, uh, of, of millions of voxels. The visual identification of these lesions, even by expert uh, radiologists, is, uh, is problematic. The agreement is, is in fact, um, uh, somewhat disappointingly low, with errors in both directions, either uh, seeing lesions that are, in fact, not new or calling lesions new that are not new or, or missing uh, uh, lesions that are, in fact, present but not new, or, uh, present and new but not visualized. So the you can see from this, uh, the, the pictures on the right, that the, you know, any individual slice can be associated with very many lesions. You have uh, very many slices associated with every brain image. And for a person to go through these and not miss a single new bright spot, or, um, or realize that a scan which might be taken at a slightly different angle from uh, the comparator scan, um, has a, um, you know, a, a lesion at the back of one slice, which is uh, on a different slice in the previous image, is, is not a trivial task. And there are many errors, uh, in fact, when this is done manually. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the new T2 lesion counts basically serve to integrate activity since the previous scan. The, um, the GAD enhancing lesions, which I uh, discussed briefly before, um, are a marker of more acute current uh, disease activity. And the image on the right shows an example of uh, GAD enhancing lesion, the bright spot. Uh, the, um, the, the, the problems with identifying GAD enhancing lesions are shown in the, in the bottom uh, images. There, are, there may be multiple lesions, but there are many more uh, bright spots in the GAD enhanced uh, images due to enhancement of normal structures, primarily blood vessels. And it is not trivial to, uh, to uh, disambiguate uh, these normal structures from, in fact, lesions, uh, which, uh, which, which again may be small and, and not, very, uh, not very strongly enhancing. So the um, returning a, a bit to clinical trials, the development of new treatments for MS requires uh, usually a global effort uh, with thousands of scans from hundreds of different scanners. And so automated methods that are uh, accurate and precise are very important, but these have to be very robust in order to, uh, to provide uh, reliable data from many, many scanners uh, uh, located around the world. Uh, my involvement um, in, in this effort um, most recently has been um, through a effort funded by the International Progressive MS Alliance, the IPMSA, uh, which is uh, devoted towards uh, collecting or federating a, a large number of scans and, uh, and associated clinical data from uh, many clinical trials that have been done recently in MS. Uh, this involves tens of thousands of patients and uh, literally thousands of different imaging centers, each with a different scanner. It's a non-trivial challenge, as Tao will, uh, will describe to you, because we have uh, multiple uh, imaging modalities, as you can see here, T1-weighted, T2-weighted, proton density-weighted, flare, uh, T1 post-contrast. We have multiple uh, time points for each person uh, who is scanned serially, uh, you know, at the beginning of the, scan of the trial before they go on the drug, and then at different intervals after they go on the drug. Um, and um, we have, for many of these trials, uh, expert-generated lesion labels for uh, these many thousands of, uh, of, of scans, uh, and not a task that can be easily accomplished in an academic uh, setting. Uh, so uh, we've been uh, collaborating with uh, Professor uh, Arbel for years now to uh, develop machine learning methods to try and automate uh, these tasks. Um, and um, uh, the, uh, th these, this collaboration with, uh, with, with uh, Professor Arbel and her, uh, and her colleagues uh, has uh, resulted in uh, very major improvements in our ability to, uh, to actually uh, detect and segment lesions in these clinical trials. This is uh, a significant increase in efficiency and, it, uh, and, and most importantly, a significant um, uh, increase in the 
accuracy and precision of the outcome measures that we make, which translates into uh, more efficient uh, trials, greater statistical power, uh, you know, less time, less patience, less money uh, in, in involved. Another thing that we would like to do um, uh, relates to precision medicine, which has been discussed uh, previously. We'd like to be able to predict what's going to happen uh, in individuals uh, with MS. Uh, will they have uh, relapses or MRI disease activity? Will they suffer from disability progression? And will they respond to a, uh, to a particular uh, treatment uh, or not? So the prediction of future MRI lesion activity based on a baseline MRI would be extremely valuable. It would offer, uh, for one thing, a better understanding of the, the natural history of the disease. Uh, also uh, uh, allow for an automatic assessment of risk and appropriate treatment selection, either something um, uh, you know, highly effective that might be more dangerous or something perhaps only moderately effective that might be safer. Um, it would also allow, uh, hopefully, for prediction of treatment efficacy or treatment response on a, on a drug-specific uh, basis. This is currently not possible with the clinical or the imaging data that, that we collect. The standard outcome metrics are, I mean, they have some predictive value, but it's not sufficient. Um, so um, we're quite, uh, quite keen to develop AI methods that will allow us to um, uh, predict uh, future disability. Um, in particular, uh, this is important for trials in progressive NS because at the moment, uh, we don't have a marker such as new T2 lesion formation or GAD formation that lets us perform efficient uh, early stage trials. Uh, we have to go to um, uh, large phase three trials, which cost hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, we would like to develop markers for predicting whether a given treatment is going to be effective or not without the, uh, before going to these large trials. Um, and so we need to develop uh, better, uh, better methods. Hopefully uh, AI will be able to do this uh, to uh, predict disability progression and to predict treatment response. Um, the problem, uh, as I alluded, is that the lesions are not well correlated with disease progression. The lesions we can very effectively suppress now but our ability to suppress uh, disease progression is actually uh, disappointingly uh, limited. Um, structure volumes uh, are not, uh, not sufficient, as I said, um, but structural changes have to be associated with uh, progression. And so um, we, uh, we believe uh, that we will be able to find changes in the MRI that we're currently not seeing or measuring with our, uh, with our current outcomes that will in fact correlate with and, and be able to predict these disease progression and, and treatment response. Uh, so I'll turn it back over to Tal now. Thanks very much for your attention. Okay, great. So thank you very much for that thorough introduction. Um, okay, so with that, I'm gonna talk to you very briefly about some uh, work that we've done in our group on multiple sclerosis lesion detection and uh, segmentation. And so um, in the context of clinical trials, we have just already developed some sort of probabilistic machine learning techniques for detecting and segmenting T2 lesions, um, new and enlarging T2 lesions on longitudinal or sequential MRI scans and gadolinium enhanced lesions. And so um, some of these methods are the methods that Dr. Arnold alluded to that were placed into the commercial software pipeline of our industrial partner so that they can be used for clinical trial analysis for pretty much uh, most of, or of the new uh, drugs recently approved and used worldwide. So I will not get to, too much into the methods, but just to tell you, um, we've built probabilistic methods for all of them, which means that we've included uh, and modeled the uncertainty, which is inherent to all of these problems. So we, for T2 lesion segmentation and detection, we developed a probabilistic model that in fact is an iterative hierarchical graphical model for those that know it's a Markov random field. And the idea is um, uh, to basically input an, a sequence of MRI images. Um, we have a graphical model which looks at the voxels and, uh, and their neighbors and infers a probability of each voxel being a lesion. They're grouped 
into candidate lesion, um, lesions on the image, and then a higher level graphical model takes relationship to neighboring structures into account uh, probabilistically as well as the intensities of the group. So the idea here is that we're designed to be very, very sensitive and to detect all the lesions, even the small ones. And the method was shown to have significant advantage, particularly for small lesions, which make up a very large proportion of the lesions in, in the context of clinical trials. We also developed methods um, on segmenting new and resolving lesions in serial MRI, as was stated in the, in the relapsing remitting phase of the disease. Um, the lesions, um, new lesions uh, appear and, and grow and other lesions resolve. So we developed uh, completely or partially. And we developed a, a probabilistic Bayesian machine learning method to sort of track and detect the evolution of these new T2 lesions over time. So here we have baseline image here. You could see week four, week 12 and so on. Uh, the model actually integrates information from the images at all these time points and sort of learns probabilistic models for the kinds of changes that we have in terms of intensity, um, transitions from one class to the other, for example, lesions to healthy tissues and other things um, in, a, in a big Bayesian model. And you can see here, the result is that um, the system differentiates between stable lesions here, which we can see in red, uh, resolving or shrinking lesions, which we can see here in blue, and the new uh, or enlarging lesions, which appear, which is very helpful in assessing treatment effects, both in the clinic and in clinical trials. And then we also built the first probabilistic machine learning framework. This is also a graphical model, a conditional random field to automatically detect gadolinium enhanced MS lesions, that very challenging task, which Dr. Arnold referred to. The method also combines both voxel level and uh, higher level information to basically maximally pull apart um, non-lesional versus lesional enhancements. So these are just some qualitative results to show you where we trained on a fairly big clinical trial with over 2000 scans from over 200 different centers and we tested it on two other big clinical trials you could see here. Just wanna show you the kind of task that's involved. So here you have the image. Um, these are three different patient images and here you could see the image and in the middle are all of the enhancements um, after you inject the patient with a contrast agent. And among all of these enhancements, the only one that is actually due to the disease, this GAD and lithium enhanced uh, lesion is right over here. And our method was able to find this lesion here as a zoom in of what it looks like. And that's the case for each of these three uh, uh, different patient cases. So our result, in fact, had um, approximately 0.9%, 0.9 sensitivity for um, a false detection rate of around 0.2. So wait a minute. These are three different probabilistic graphical models. You should be asking yourself, can deep learning solve everything? So we actually did develop um, deep learning algorithms for all three of these tasks. Um, the new and enlarging P2 lesion and GAD enhancing lesion uh, deep learning models were the first ones to, to enter the field. But I'll just tell you for uh, a minute um, about the uh, T2 lesion model for a second. So um, we developed this framework. It's just an adaptation of a very popular uh, model called the 3D unit. And um, this idea is just to take the images and to produce a T2 lesion label map. Okay, so this is a very popular method uh, used for segmentation throughout the field. And in general, uh, we, um, we tested it on, and trained it and tested on a clinical trial of over a thousand MS patient brain images. Um, this trial is multi-center, multi-scanner. Um, and if you actually look at the results here, this is true positive rate over false detection rate. Um, in, in green here, you can see, in fact, the lesion level results, which are actually pretty good at 0.2 false detection rate, or we're way up here. But if you actually um, look at it according to lesion size, you can see that up here are the medium and large lesions, but down here is where the small lesions are. So in fact, it does not, it's not very sensitive to small lesions. Um, and that's again a problem in, in, in a lot of these trials where a lot of the lesions are quite small, three to 10 at voxels in size. So again, um, we found similar issues with the other two um, methods for new and enlarging and for catalim and hence. Uh, we do have new deep learning models that can do better than this. But the point is really um, 
how do we use deep learning in the clinic if it makes uh, mistakes in, in general that are could be quite critical? So if you actually hand the results to a clinician um, with a series of false positives and false negatives along with the correct lesion labels, um, this will lead to mistrust of the system uh, and potentially a reluctance to adopt the deep learning techniques of real clinical practice. The clinician might say, I can't trust this model. So our thoughts are, what if we could quantify the reliability of the predictions in the form of an uncertainty? So predictions are now lesion, non-lesion, and there's new uncertain class. And the idea would be that the clinician could then review um, these uncertain uh, results, um, kind of similar to, you know, sort of a junior clinician would refer to a senior when they are uncertain about a decision for a challenging case. So um, our thoughts are that uncertainty could therefore be part of the framework. So deep learning being used to accelerate clinical workflows and not replace them. And so our thoughts are that uncertainty will actually build trust um, with clinicians. Um, and so we built um, a framework to basically produce and analyze different uncertainty measures in segmenting and detecting focal pathologies, in this case, MS lesions. Um, and uh, this is some work by a uh, former student, Tanya, who's actually at Imagia, who's presenting today, and she won uh, the Young uh, Scientist Award in Mackay for this work. And our system uh, produces both voxel level segmentation results and lesion level detection results and examines different uncertainty measures for both of these tasks. So of course, if we would like the, um, these uncertainties to, and they, um, to be reviewed by the clinicians, they have to trust the confident predictions. So our uncertainty measures must have the property that when they're confident, they're correct, but when they're incorrect, they have higher uncertainties. And so how do we ensure that our uncertainty um, measure depicts, depicts this property? Um, so some work that we did in which we actually um, show that this is sort of the baseline image. You can see that there's one false positive. But if we actually reduce the uncertainty threshold, in other words, we remove um, the most uncertain conjectures. Um, and so this, if these actual false positives and false negatives then become uncertain, that means that when we filter out these uncertain predictions, the performance on the remaining uh, certain predictions should increase, which is what we showed. So let's just talk for the remaining amount of time on some deep uh, learning uh, methods that we're working on, some current work and challenges and opportunities. So as Dr. Arnold um, discussed, we are working quite hard on uh, predicting um, future disease activity from baseline MRI. And so this is some work um, that we presented uh, two years ago. Uh, we presented the first deep learning framework for activity prediction from baseline MRI and the actual lesion label. So basically the output is, um, are there any new uh, will there be any new enlarging T2 lesion labels or GAD lesions a year out from baseline? And so um, what we found is if we just gave the system baseline MRI, we actually do um, pretty much the same as random. But with the introduction of T2 lesions at baseline, we actually did quite well. And so if we provide those labels at baseline, um, we, can do, we can do pretty well in predicting activity. Um, so the, the interesting thing is if you actually look qualitatively at the results, here are the images of patients um, at baseline, and this is them in uh, a year or two later. So you can actually see here the patients that are inactive and active um, in a, are, are written out here. So these are four different patients. So you can see that um, patients here had no new lesional activity, yet they have a high D2 lesion label uh, load, which means they have a lot of lesions, but there aren't uh, a lot of, there's no change in terms of their disease activity in the MRI. And here's an example of patients which actually have new and enlarging lesions, and this patient doesn't even have very high um, lesion load at baseline. So the system is picking up something about the lesions at baseline, which are predictive of the future. But what if you don't have um, manually labeled lesion labels um, available to you? So we used our, uh, what we found is we took our baseline images and we used our deep learning model to actually predict the T2 lesion labels and then take the MRI and the predicted or inferred labels and then predicted activity. And here we found that 
we can see here in green that we did have a slight reduction in the um, area under the curve in the performance, but it still did really well. So you can use that network for that. We also built um, the first sort of preliminary end-to-end -end deep learning model to predict MS disease progression within one year of baseline based on imaging at baseline alone. So you provide everything at baseline, all the images, any labels you have, and the network produced uh, a binary output whether this patient will have um, disease progression in the future in terms of disability. Um, and so these are kind of preliminary results, which were uh, presented at Medneritz and at Middle. And um, this is a, a results on a trial from two different um, relapsing remitt remitting trials on the placebo arms. And you can see um, basically it's a fourfold validation. The area under the curve is around 0.7, which is um, starting to be uh, pretty good. And this is um, some work that we're, we're extending and we're working quite hard on right now. Um, much more importantly as well, we also um, have the uncertainty in the output. So we provide an uncertainty measure that can be used to assess the confidence in the decision. So the uh, clinician gets an output, for example, this patient won't progress and the degree of confidence in that assertion. So the computer is, they would, the clinician could then say, okay, the computer is certain this patient won't progress. Um, and so maybe I will not give it, for example, um, the high risk medication. Um, so then that's the question, uh, a really open and important question of how does the deep learning model make the decisions uh, that it makes? So the context of the, the problem of interpretability. So two years ago at a MICAI conference, Dr. McGinty, the chair of the American College of Radiology, um, asked the question in her keynote, uh, basically presented to the field this the challenge. And the challenge th they are saying to radiologists embracing AI in practice is that they don't really understand how AI arrives at a particular conclusion. And so one of the things that we're very interested in is when the machine learning method is confident about a prediction, what is the network looking at? And so our goal is to, to create new MRI-based biomarkers for disease progression. This will help us understand the disease course better and hopefully improve the efficiency of early phase clinical trials because it allows us to potentially, you know, have enrichment based on these markers or use them as drug, drug outcome markers. So current work that we're interested in is uh, predicting patient-specific disease course, predicting the treatment effect on individual patients, um, trying to determine responders. And these problems lead to many open machine learning uh, challenges, which is, for example, how do we build a spatio-temporal model of the disease course? How do we merge clinical information and medical imaging to get better predictions? And in fact, how do we merge uh, information from different clinical trials altogether? So this is something that we're working on. So now I'm going to hand over the platform to uh, Raghav, a PhD student in our group who will talk about brain tumor segmentation, uh, modeling and propagating uncertainties in deep learning models. This is in collaboration with Synaptive Medical. Synaptive Medical is a Canadian uh, based company based in Toronto, which builds neurosurgical imaging platforms uh, used by hospitals throughout North America for surgical planning. So um, over to you, Raghav. Thank you, Dal. Just give me a minute. And yep, so you can see my screen, right? Okay, so as Professor Arbel said that uh, I'm going to talk about modeling and propagating uncertainties in machine learning models uh, for patients with brain tumors. Uh, so let's dive directly into the problem. So brain tumor segmentation is a clinical, really important problem because it can be used for like multiple different tasks like diagnosis and staging of tumor, tumor classification, outcome prediction, or surgical planning. Uh, so generally, uh, there are various uh, types of tumor. Uh, in particularly for this talk, I'm just going to talk about gliomas or glioblastomas. So in that, normally a brain tumor structure is subdivided into further substructures like edema, tumor core, and enhancement. So edema is basically the swelling, enhancement is basically the active part of the tumor, and there are various uh, different modalities which are used for uh, uh, detecting or segmenting this tumor uh, substructures like flare t2 t1 and t1 post contrast 
Q and post contrast is normally used for uh, detecting the active tumor or like the enhancing tumor in that you uh, inject patient with a bolus and uh, it basically gives you where the tumor is active or with enhancement. So deep, as Tal mentioned that like nowadays everyone is working on deep learning and deep learning models have been giving good, good performance. So deep learning model based uh, methods have been giving like uh, outperforming traditional methods on a Mika Broad's uh, brain tumor segmentation sub challenge uh, consistently from last four years. Uh, and there has been various kind of uh, models which are uh, which are uh, uh, <coughs> developed for this. So I'm going to further like wait just to give me a minute. Okay, but this, uh, as Tal said, that these deep learning models have not been like integrated into original clinical practice. So why is that? As Tal mentioned, that it has to do with the problem at hand and with the kind of output which you get from the deep learning model. So what is the problem at hand? So the problem of a segmentation is really hard because of the shape, size, variability of the tumor, etc. The data is really noisy. You can have a, like a patient motion, uh, uh, noisy acquisition, etc. And also deep learning models make mistakes. So normally deep learning models, if it gives a deterministic output, it can lead to a distrust by clinicians. Like uh, if uh, there are a really easy part of the brain tumor, which a deep learning model has made mistakes and uh, clinicians looks at it, then it will say that, oh, deep learning model has not been able to pick up this easy part of the tumor itself. So it means that deep learning model is not doing good and I won't be able to trust the model. So it leads to distrust by clinicians and in turn, it will lead to uh, hesitance of them in including deep learning models into a workflow. So how do we do that? As Professor Arbel mentioned that uh, we do that by uh, defining something known as an uncertainty where model can say that, okay, I'm not sure about what my prediction is. And in that case, we can ask a clinician to review that. And in that case, if you look at the most uncertain areas and uh, ask clinician to review and for the most certain areas, if the network is right, then clinicians will trust it more and can integrate it into the clinical workflow. So how do we get this uncertainty? So there has been various methods for uh, estimating uncertainty recently. Uh, I'm just going to talk about a Monte Carlo dropout based method in which uh, you normally have a neural network assuming a unit, you train the unit and you have a dropout, uh, which is a regularization, uh, which is normally used for training, but you also use it at testing, which allows you to get multiple samples of the same input and you get multiple outputs. And then you can basically, uh, uh, estimate the mean segmentation and the uncertainty associated with it. This uncertainty can be of different types like uh, standard deviation, uh, entropy, mutual information, etc. Uh, and as I said that we want to make sure that when we evaluate this uncertainty that the most confident predictions are correct and the incorrect prediction are having a higher uncertainty because that will lead to better trust by the clinicians. So uh, how do we do that? So we do that by filtering out the most uncertain predictions uh, and, and evaluate the performance and the remaining one. So what do I mean by that? So let's take the example of this brain tumor task. So because it's a segmentation task, we are just going to talk about dice. But if it is a classification task, we can talk about an accuracy. So in segmentation, what we expect is that once we start thresholding out the most uncertain prediction, uh, what do I mean by un uh, thresholding out uh, is that when you threshold out, you don't consider it for the calculation of the metric of interest here. So in this dice, you don't calculate uh, the dice for the thresholded one, but you calculate dice for the remaining one. So what we expect is that once you threshold out more and more uncertain pixel, the remaining one will be certain pixels. So in that case, you will expect the metric of, in, uh, metric of interest here dice to improve. So in this way, we can evaluate and we can make sure that uh, our deep learning models are producing good results. And we uh, organized the uncertainty quantification challenge with broads in lock since last two years. If you are interested, you can please have a look at it. Uh, so another question that uh, apart from just asking clinicians to review the most uncertain prediction, how else can we use it? So in a normally in a medical imaging pipeline, like a brain tumor segmentation, there are like cascaded, cascaded prediction tasks, uh, which are done before doing the task of the interest. So let's take an example of tumor segmentation. 
So first you have multiple modalities. So you do a multimodal registration, then you do a skull stripping, then you do an intensity normalization, and at the end, then you do a tumor segmentation, which in turn can be used for a diagnosis purpose. So here there are like four or five tasks before the task of interest, and each one is preceded by a, a, a n number of tasks. So deep learning model have been introduced for all these tasks. And if we take the deterministic deep learning model, and if a model is making mistake at any one of the previous tasks, the errors will propagate towards the uh, downstream task and it can accumulate. So in that case, uh, uh, the downstream task can be like hindered in a really bad way. So what do we do that uh, to solve this? So the hypothesis is that instead of just propagating deterministic inference results from deep learning models, we propagate predictions and uncertainties. So as I said that you can use a, uh, uh, any Bayesian deep learning model to get the uncertainties, you propagate it to the downstream task. So this is just a general uh, dream. Uh, so I'm going to talk mainly about brain tumor segmentation and synthesis here. And this is just a general segmentation network, which perform really good. But as I said that for brain tumor segmentation, you have multiple modalities, like four different modalities, T1, T2, Flare, and T1C. But as I mentioned previously, that due to clinical, in the clinical practice, due to different reasons, it, you might not have access to the all four different modalities available. So in that case, what we do, we try to synthesize the fourth missing modality or one of the missing modalities using the other available. So how it can be useful? It can be useful in assisting the, in the clinicians in terms of assessment. Also, it can be useful for improving the segmentation. So I want, uh, we developed a deep learning model named RSNet. I won't go into detail of that. So in that you have three different modalities and you try to synthesize the fourth one. So this is a three to one synthesis. You have T1, T2 and T1C and you try to synthesize the flare one. Similar way you have all other three and try to synthesize T1, T2 or T1C. So the first row represents the real MR and the second one represents the synthesis. So here you can see that for flare T1 and T2, we are getting a good enough uh, synthesis and it looks uh, somewhat close to the real uh, MR images. But if you look at T1C, we can see that the uh, enhancing part is not good. And we don't expect the enhancing part to be really good uh, when you are uh, trying to synthesize the T1C because as I had mentioned, it requires a uh, another contrast agent to be injected in the patient uh, to acquire T1C and which is not present in T1 or T1, T2 or flare. But we can see that uh, network is making mistakes. So it would be nice to convey these mistakes to the clinician and can be used for further downstream tasks. So as we did previously, we use a Monte Carlo dropout to get mean and uh, standard deviation, which is basically the mean synthesis and the standard deviation. Uh, so we can see here that uh, as uh, in this one, that when we synthesize the T1C and flare, we can see that network is not performing really good for T1C, but it is also uncertain about that. So if you, if you communicate it with the clinicians or to the downstream tasks, it should be useful. Similarly for flare, that we can see that uh, there is a hyper intensity near this, uh, in this part, but uh, it is uncertain about it. So how do we do use it for the downstream task? As I said, that you just get the inference and uncertainty associated with the output, and then you propagate to the downstream task. So here, the downstream task of interest is a, a multi-class tumor segmentation. So for that, we just propagate uh, synthesized MR and its uncertainty associated with the, uh, all the three other available modalities and try to get the tumor segmentation. So, uh, we did this for T1 and T1C synthesis and flare synthesis, because as we looked previously, that those were the toughest modality to synthesize. So here, the first two row represent the T1C synthesis results, and the last row represents the flare synthesis. Uh, and uh, we can see that uh, from the first, first row is the ground, first column is the ground row, second column is the synthesized MR, uh, and the third column is the segmentation when you just use the synthesized MR. So here you can see in the first row that uh, you expect here yellow is the enhancing tumor and you can expect, you can see that synth in the synthesized MR, uh, uh, enhancement is not properly synthesized. But if when, uh, because of that, when you do the segmentation with that, you can see that instead of getting it as an enhancing tumor, it is detected as a non-enhancing code. 
but when you look at the synthesis uncertainty associated with that you can see that uncertainty is higher so when you propagate both synthesis mr and synthesis uncertainty network is able to correct its mistakes and able to give you a better performance and you can see that by uh, looking at the results that enhancing uh, tumor is better segmented in the first row similarly in the last row you can see that for the player synthesis uh, in the synthesis mr there is an enhancing uh, enhancement inside the ventricles but normally it is not there because of normally it should not be there because there is no enhancement within the ventricles now if you look at the synthesis segmentation with only the synthesis mr you can see that there is an edema inside the ventricles now when you look at the synthesis uncertainty you can see that whenever there is an uh, un, uh, hyper intensity inside the ventricles it is also uncertain so when you use both synthesized mr and synthesis uncertainty you are able to correct the mistakes and the network is able to get better performance and there is no edema segmented inside that so uh, in terms of qualitative results we evaluated using dice and we can see that we get a better performance when you have uncertainties so i will uh, allow professor abel to conclude this session and i'll give uh, mic back to her Okay, thank you very much, um, Raghav. So just in conclusion, um, I just wanted to say machine learning and specifically deep learning has enormous potential to revolutionize medicine and healthcare. Um, you know, we have the opportunity to develop new machine learning methods. We have a lot of open hard problems. Um, I think the main theme of what we were saying today is uncertainties need to be addressed and not swept under the rug. So either we can we need to model the uncertainties in the problem, uh, and that would indeed improve performance. Um, communicate the uncertainties to the clinicians, which we feel would increase trust and and help integrate the methods into the clinical workflow. And propagating uncertainties across the task would indeed um, be very helpful, uh, both as Raghav showed to improve performance, but also um, to avoid the accumulation of errors in general. Um, I think the theme today generally is in, in line with what our message is, is that for clinical impact, you need, um, as, as we develop our machine learning methods, we need synergy with clinicians and the end users. It's very important so that we can design our methods to be doing something that would be useful in the clinic and for clinical trials as well. And it's very important to tie the methods themselves and the metrics of success to the real clinical objectives. Um, and I just, one more slide, just wanted to thank all of our sponsors and to all of you for your attention. Um, so, um, Raghav, I guess um, we had a couple of questions. Um, no open questions. Uh, so there was a question which uh, Dr. Arnold answered, so you can see it there. Um, there was another question about um, Monte Carlo dropout. So Raghav, maybe you would like to answer that. <laughs> um, the question is where to put um, um, dropout in a network. Do we put in every layer, input layer? Is there a better place to put dropout in the network? Um, and we, we know that this is an area of research and there's different thoughts about this. Um, and what benefit does dropout have on network performance anyway? Uh, yeah, so there has been a paper from Yarin Gall who basically developed the Monte Carlo dropout based method. Uh, the paper is known as concrete dropout. So in that, what they try to do is they try to address these problems of where to put the dropout and what should be the uh, what should be the uh, what should be the like probability of dropping out the networks uh, like neurons and etc. Uh, so they try to learn that. So their conclusion was that. Uh, uh, initial layers, if you have dropout, that won't be too much useful compared to the last layers if it is a classification network, because class layers are the dense layers, which basically does your, uh, basically defines the boundary, linear boundary between two different classes, and initial layers are the feature extraction layers. But uh, it's still an open problem in terms of where to put and how to put. So if you are not using concrete dropout and you're trying to manually tune it, then it should be tuned in any another way for
for any another parameter like a deep learning model. Like you try to tune the learning rate, similarly you have to tune the dropout rate. I hope this answers the question. Well, I guess the second part was um, why is it a good idea to use dropout for network performance anyway? So I, like I guess my. So so dropout is just a. a one kind of a regularization, right? So it basically regularize or the regularize your search space of the number of kind of weights your network can take. So it uh, does that. And when you take a, during the testing, you take the Monte Carlo dropout, it basically gives you multiple samples and you basically accumulate the samples and not just do an approximation of the samples when you do a test. So I'm not sure. If um, yeah, um, I think we don't have any more questions. So um, thank you everyone for your attention and um, and thank you to my uh, colleagues who spoke today with me and for the organizers for inviting.